Uh, hello, everybody. Should we uh, try and start this session? Uh, I think this is a very important session. We all know every Friday evening there are registrars telling their consultants it was dry when I left the patient, sir. Uh, and uh, invariably it, it, it doesn't work out that way in time. So we're going to have a discussion today about hemostatic adjuncts. We're going to start off with uh, Professor Murphy talking about the importance of stopping the bleeding. And then it's our pleasure to welcome Professor Jepson from Gothenburg, who's going to talk about potential patients who uh, we can identify before surgery uh, to try and sort out uh, preventing them from bleeding. And then uh, Dr. Royston, who needs no introduction, who's a long publication record of protein, is going to talk to us about not so much the evidence base behind a protein, but from the regulator's point of view. And then finally moving on to Dr. Besser from Patworth in Cambridge, who has a long uh, experience of helping the surgeons cope with the bleeding afterwards. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Professor Murphy. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organising committee for the invitation to speak today. Um, the original title of my talk was The Importance of Stopping the Bleeding, The Role of Blood Conservation. But I changed that to this term called blood management, which is the new kind of trendy way of, of, of talking about this topic. And we have to refer to that now because it's been a term that's been adopted by the World Health Organization and also by our own National Health Service in terms of our better blood transfusion strategy. So we talk about blood management now uh, rather than blood conservation. I mean, it'll be changed again in five years or so, but we have to call it that for now. So I have no conflicts of interest. So blood, blood management is two things. It's the management of anemia and it's the management of coagulopathy. Um, and these are important in cardiac surgery because they're so common. So basically 75% of our patients become anemic. If you define it with a hemoglobin less than 10 at some point in the perioperative course. And because coagulopathic hemorrhage uh, is not as common, but it has a bigger impact on, on outcome. Uh, so retronotomy rates uh, are 2 to 7% in the UK, uh, and transfusion of non-red cell component components is about 15 to 25%, depending on the survey. Um, it's very difficult to define coagulopathy because there is no definition of it, but it's somewhere between these two. Uh, perioperative anemia, first, uh, we have this thing called the anemia paradox. So basically, as your hemoglobin gets, gets lower, either during cardiopulmonary bypass or during your perioperative stay, there's a higher risk of morbidity, in this case, kidney injury, in this case, stroke. And this is, this is constant. This has been known about for years and years, and no one's really tried to address the causes of anemia. It's multifactorial. It relates to your comorbidity, renal failure, diabetes, uh, poor LV function, a whole host of other causes. It's caused by hemodilution. During, during surgery and bleeding after surgery. So it's multifactorial. But when your hematocrit gets low, that's a very bad thing. Uh, trying to find evidence linking coagulopathy and outcome is very difficult. As I say, there's no definition of coagulopathy. If we simply use the, 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 the term uh, resonotomy for bleeding, which, like it or loathe it, it is a good measure of coagulopathic hemorrhage. And you see that actually resonotomy for bleeding is strongly associated. And this is associated, not cause relationship, associated with an increased risk of death. And do we really think that blood management is important? Well, it's very difficult, it's very difficult to, to prove causality because there are lots of ethical and methodological issues around, around blood management because it's so ubiquitous, it happens at every patient. And it's not like we can randomize a patient to blood management or not blood management or coagulopathy or not coagulopathy or anemia or not anemia. We have to nuance our trial design around that, which creates problems. But this is a patient I remember very well. This was a redo, 82-year-old. He was a redo operation. I looked him in the eye, I said, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I think you'll be fine. I gave him very low uh, operative mortality. He bled. This was him immediately post-op. This was him about six hours later. He's developed diastolic and systolic dysfunction. And the only thing that I could ever really pin on why this man's heart stopped working was the fact that he had a massive blood transfusion. He didn't become shocked or tampon added. He just bled about 200, 250 mils an hour for six or seven hours. He had a massive blood transfusion. His heart stopped working. He developed low cardiac output. He, he went on to a filter, he had a retroperitoneal hemorrhage, and he died. And to be honest, me, I believe that it, this was an issue of the patient who died because of inadequate blood management. What's the evidence for blood management? Well, it's very, very poor. It's very good if you're an academic, but it's not very good if you're a practicing surgeon. There is this uh, summary of evidence-based guidelines. They were first uh, published in 2007, and there were only seven level one recommendations in this, of which three were subsequently shown to be not substantiated by evidence or high quality evidence. And, and these have been renewed in 2011, and these are evidence-based guidelines, but they haven't really, there's been no real development in the evidence base. Uh, 
But there are these emerging themes, and, and really they're about more about assessment and pre-assessment as being key things that we do very badly, uh, but also this new title of patient blood management, which I'll talk about a little bit. And this lack of evidence leads to wide variation in practice, and this is, a, again, an academic stream, because if there's a lack of evidence and variation in practice, well, there's a strong rationale to do trials to develop the evidence base, but there is wide variation in practice. So this is the UK cardiac surgery audit. Uh, we, it was over three months in 2010. Uh, 6,368 patients had cabbage or cabbage valve or valve. And we saw that of all the operations, 52% of patients were transfused. 21% had four or more units of blood. About 20 to 25% of patients had some kind of pro, uh, uh, some kind of non-blood uh, component. And what was actually most interesting was this wide scatter. This is a funnel plot of the number of patients. These are individual units. This wide scatter of, of, of blood management interventions between units in the UK in a contemporaneous cohort. And this shows wide variation in practice. And this persists, in fact, the variation, if you adjust for bleeding and transfusion risk, which we have done in another study, you see that this variation is more enhanced. And actually, about, there are about a third of units have significantly higher uh, bleeding and transfusion rates than might be expected given their operative risk. This is also reflected in a different analysis that was done of the S CTS data uh, with the help of Ben Bridgewater. And other things that came out of this audit was this very kind of erratic uh, uh, and uh, non-constant use of, uh, of point of care testing and other blood management interventions that might help us with our decision making. Blood uh, Cardiac surgery utilizes a major proportion of all blood components in the UK. There's the Easter study, it's a bit old now, but it shows that we use 5% of all red cells, but we use a significant proportion of all the platelets and FFP in the UK. There are going to be blood shortages in the UK within the next 20 years, and obviously it's, it's incumbent on us to make our, our, our surgery safe, but also not to use what is a very precious and valuable resource. So I said I'd mentioned this thing called patient blood management. Patient blood management is uh, it's something that's been developed by a, a focus group, so it has no basis in science, there's no methodological uh, uh, basis for this, there's no evidence to support it, but it has become very politically hot. So it's been adopted by the World Health Organization, it's been adopted by the NHS, it's been adopted by, adopted by a lot of the blood services in, uh, in Australasia. So this is something we have to be familiar with. And it, has, it focuses on uh, careful preoperative assessment, to optimise patients' own red cell mass with iron and so on, then minimising blood loss, which is the management of, of um, uh, coagulopathy and bleeding and preventing hemodilution, and then uh, maximising tolerance to anemia, so by, whereby we, we create a state where patients might be able to physiologically tolerate anemia better. And they call these the three pillars of patient blood management, which has a particular hit of mine. So, trying to deal with anemia first, we have the transfusion paradox, and the transfusion paradox is is that as, as your hemoglobin get, gets lower, and this is baseline hemoglobin, as your hemoglobin gets lower in cardiac surgery, your risk of, of, of end organ injury increases. But if you transfuse these patients, actually in paradox, and transfusion is the most widely used and effective way of reversing acute anemia in cardiac surgery, or any other acute uh, clinical setting for that matter. But reversing this anemia with a blood transfusion actually increases that risk further. And then if you look at the dose response between the number of units transfused and the incidence of inflammatory organ injury, and there are the three main causes, the three main organs that are affected are the lung, the heart, and the kidneys, you see this, this clear linear dose response, which suggests that there's this kind of harmful relationship between transfusion and, uh, and outcomes. Although, uh, to say this is uh, evidence of causality, that would be improper. This is an association. So it's, uh, it's improper to suggest that there is an association, sorry, there is a cause between transfusion on the basis of this data. Uh, I'll talk about that again in, uh, in a minute. So there is a, a methodological basis of why transfusion might be harmful. Uh, as uh, red cells are stored, their en high energy phosphate levels decline. They develop these changes in the red cells. They develop these speculations. They become these things called ikinocytes, which is these kind of starburst shaped cells. And they release lots of these microparticles, which are very pro inflammatory, but they also have very poor oxygen carrying and auto regulatory uh, capacity. And then there is a seminal report here from Koch and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed this. Uh, sine wave shaped relationship between the days of storage of blood that's been true, transfused and a composite adverse outcome. Again, it's not a cause relationship, but it's a kind of uh, it, it's it's strong it's a, a strong evidence of an association. When we review all the evidence to look at a causal relationship, and here we have these are the non-randomized studies. These are observational studies at the bottom. These are randomized trials of liberal 
versus uh, restrictive transfusion in non-cardiac surgery, and these are randomized trials of restrictive versus liberal transfusion in cardiac surgery. And what we see is all the observational studies in cardiac surgery seem to show that transfusion is harmful. Okay? All the randomized trials in non-cardiac surgery seem to show that transfusion is harmful. But actually, all the randomized trials in, in cardiac surgery seem to show something diff different. Now, that difference is not statistically significant. Okay? But this is what we call equipoise. So basically, we really don't know. And that's the basis for a, for a, a, a definitive trial to try and determine whether or not actually transfusion is good or bad for you. Um, to deal with the observational data first, if you look at the observational data, it's, it's absolutely full of bias. The observational studies, that, these studies that show 10,000 patients, all the patients that were transfused died more, had more kidney injury, they're so full of bias, I don't think they're reliable. And I think in almost every clinical situation where you have evaluated, tested hypothesis, you develop an observational data with a randomized trial in cardiac surgery, it's been shown to be completely untrue in almost every case. So I would be very cautious about ever using observational data in cardiac surgery to guide practice. And this is a clear evidence here. This is a funnel plot. And it clearly shows that there are no studies which show a positive effect of blood transfusion. And if the evidence were complete, there should be. There should be some here, but there's not. So there's clear evidence of publication bias. There's also lots of other kinds of bias. So basically, if you look at the effects of large volume blood transfusion versus small blood transfusion observational studies, these are very, very different. Basically, if that's not specified in, 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 the, in the study, that's a major source of bias. The very fact that you have these patients here, they're completely different from these patients here, so the inclusion of them all as a homogeneous group is clearly improper. It's a clear source of bias in these studies. So I would, very, I would caution against the over-interpretation of these studies. There are also issues about the effect in relation to the number of units, but also the, the severity of anemia. So this is the, the average increase in an ischemic complication from an observational study. And if you stratify by, the, by transfusion or not transfused, so that's the odds ratio of an adverse outcome for transfused versus not transfused, stratify by the nadir hematocrit and the units of blood, you see a very, very complicated relationship. And that's not reflected typically in the observational studies that we see. So what we have to do is we have to do a definitive trial, and this is the multi-center randomized controlled trial of transfusion indication threshold reduction on transfusion rates, morbidity, and healthcare resources following cardiac surgery, which I call TITER II for short. And this is the definitive trial, and, and the results of this will be presented tomorrow in one of our afternoon sessions. So I'm not going to present them here, but just to say this was the largest ever, this is the largest randomized trial ever performed just in, in the UK, in cardiac surgery in the UK. So we recruited 4,000 patients, of which 200, 2,003 were randomized. And we randomized them to two thresholds, a threshold of 9, a threshold of 7.5. And you can argue the toss about which of those thresholds is right or wrong. But actually, that, those were the thresholds that we thought we could manage to get the most engagement with across the UK cardiac surgical community. And we showed a clear difference in the percentage that were transfused in a completely randomized uh, equal group of patients. And we showed a very difference in the overall transfusion rate. And the answer will be presented tomorrow in a separate session. So I'm afraid I can't present that here because, uh, well, I haven't agreed with my co-investigators that I would present that here, so I can't tell you. So you can come to the session tomorrow. But anyway, moving on. What is coagulopathy? Dealing with anemia. We've done a definitive trial. I think we know the results. You'll have to come tomorrow to see them. So what is coagulopathy? So to focus on coagulopathy, I've gone to haematologists and said, what is coagulopathy? No one has any idea what coagulopathy is. We all think we know, but no one knows. Is it an abnormal PT time, which I clearly, I tell you, is not coagulopathy, even though that is the hematological definition of, an, of coagulopathy. Is it a fibrinogen level of less than 1.5? Maybe, maybe not. Is it a syndrome of disordered endothelial function coagulation inflammation? Well, clearly it is, but how do you use that in a clinical trial? Is it severe bleeding? Maybe, maybe it's just a stitch through the, a wire through the mammary. And is it severe bleeding reversed by non-red cell blood component transfusion? And that's actually quite a useful definition. But actually, there is no definition. It makes it impossible to compare evaluative studies and very difficult to design randomized controlled trials. Looking at transfusion rates or reversal of, of, of bleeding with non-blood components, you see the same variation as we saw with red cell units, indicating this is why clinical variation which indicates a, a clear equipoise and a lack of evidence to support decision making. And the evidence to, to support management of coagulopathy is even worse than the evidence we use to manage anemia. 
And quite a lot is so complex, we really don't even understand it. And actually, one of the problems we have with, with, uh, with clinical research is that a funder will only fund a study that focuses on one very small aspect of this problem. But actually, this is a very mu complex, multifactorial problem. And we, don't really, we haven't really designed the, the right kind of trials to deal with this. But it's all these things together that contribute to, to coagulopathy. And this is something I show in the Birmingham Review course to, to uh, pre-FRCS uh, pre Part 3 uh, uh, students or, or postgraduate students. And, but basically it highlights that there's a very kind of complex way you can address this. You can address it preoperatively, interoperatively, and postoperatively. And again, each of these different components of treatment requires evaluation in clinical trials, which, which we haven't done very well. We've done some, but not so much. Point of care testing is a very important way of, of, of measuring coagulopathy, but again, our point of care tests aren't very good. The two that we use are the TEG and the ROTEM, and, and they're kind of quite good for people with severe coagulopathy as a result of uh, uh, depletion of coagulation factors, but they're not very good measures of platelet dysfunction. And they're not very specific. They can't tell you whether it's platelet dysfunction or lack of fibrinogen or whatever. The ROTEM maybe is slightly better than the TEG, although there's no head-to-head -head comparison currently, and it does give you a measure of fibrinogen levels which make it uh, slightly better. But actually, there's, very, there's no really good evidence that using these things is better than not using these things. And if you do uh, uh, randomized controlled trials to compare them, they haven't shown any benefit. This is a new technique. This is the whole blood aggregometry, which overcomes some of the limitations of TEG and ROTEM by being able to measure platelet function. And the chief limitation of this is that it was developed by cardiologists to measure the potency of their antiplatelet uh, agents when they're putting in stents. So it's very good at measuring your inhibition of your GP, 2, 3P, uh, whatever it is, receptor, or your, uh, the activity of your clopidogrel, but actually as a way of actually mi measuring coagulopathy after cardiac surgery. That's not what it's designed for, and it's probably not that good. Um, again, it hasn't been systematically evaluated in a large-scale trial yet. This is something that holds a lot of promise, more than maybe any of the other point-of-care tests we have. And this is your endogenous thrombin potential. So basically, when you measure your PT, the PT time is the time it takes for you to begin to form a thrombin in a glass jar at 37 degrees. Okay? That's absolutely not a measure of the hemostatic capacity of your blood or your cardiovascular system in any way. That's why we can all operate on people with high NRs of 2.5. That doesn't really affect the bleeding. But the endogenous thrombin potential is different because you activate your thrombin and you measure, you measure your thrombin burst using something called a thrombinoscope. The technology is currently quite clunky and it's difficult to use, but there will be new, new uh, equipment that comes online to make this something a, a point of care test. And this, the area under this curve, as well as the peak curve, are very good, accurate, sensitive and specific markers of, of your uh, ability to, to bleed or not bleed. And that's been shown, there's a guy called Kevin Carcuti has some, done some nice work looking at this in conjunction with other kind of clinical uh, risk scores. And he's shown that they have very good discrimination by using this. It's limitation, it's not truly a point of care test, uh, but new technology will help us develop this. And this is far more accurate than any of the other tests that we have. These are the randomized control trials I was referring to, the use of TEG and ROTEM versus controls in the, in the management of blood management. And they show that absolutely no difference in any of the important clinical endpoints. The limitation of this meta-analysis is that the trials weren't that good. They were full of bias, selection bias, uh, attrition bias, all kinds of bias. So actually, the, you, know, you only get out of these systematic reviews what you put in. And the evidence that we put in wasn't very good. What they put in wasn't very good. So I think we would have to say that we don't really have good evidence to show that our existing technology is any good. And I think we have to look forward to new technology and hope that it can provide something better. A very topical thing is when you withdraw these antiplatelet agents, uh, I think in terms of cardiac surgery, it always makes our surgery easier if we withdraw the antiplatelet agents five to seven days before surgery. I think what we never appreciate because of lead time bias is the risk that that poses to our patients. So for example, whenever we look at uh, a, an observational study in cardiac surgery, of, we took these patients, half of them had their clopidogrel withdrawn, half of them didn't. What we, we only measure outcome from the time of surgery. We don't actually appreciate the the lead time bias caused by the harm to the patients between the time of stopping the clopidogrel and the time they have their surgery. And we don't measure that very well. I know Neil Hyle has, has done a nice presentation describing the, this, what this lead time bias might mean. But actually, in my clinical practice, I tend not to uh, remove antiplatelet agents at all because it, it, it's, uh, the evidence from randomized control trials suggests that we shouldn't. You mustn't forget these other adjuncts which can affect um, bleeding and, and anemia. 
uh, things like minimally invasive surgery, up cap surgery, and MEC, they all have the benefit of they prevent hemodilution. They also reduce the, the evidence, the, the instance of, of coagulopathy. And then there is these other uh, aspects as well. To me, to my mind, actually, I tell you, the thing that makes my clinical practice different when I'm doing a Jehovah's Witness is not whether I put them on a MEC or whether I give them tranexamic acid high dose or whatever. It's I basically make sure I stop all the bleeding. You know, you can't underestimate the role of actually just, just stopping the bleeding. So if we look at all these different blood management interventions, they're all very good at, uh, at, at stopping, at reducing transfusion rates. And this is a, a, a forest plot. And this is a summary of all these systematic reviews that have been published in the literature, looking at these individual interventions in a forest plot summarized here. And it shows that they all actually do reduce transfusion exposure. What they don't do is alter clinical outcome, which is probably a reflection of the fact that most of these trials are conducted in low-risk cardiac surgery patients who have very low risk of outcome. Also, the fact that actually the clinical, the quality of some of these trials is not very good. But you see that actually some of them actually increase adverse outcome. So if actually, for example, preoperative autologous donation actually increases your total blood exposure. Desmopressin increases risks of hypertension. I know we're going to have a talk on a protein, but I'll touch on it briefly. There's obviously the systematic reviews uh, of a protein versus tranexamic acid which suggests that there may be a slightly higher risk of death with a protein compared to tranexamic acid. So actually, we don't have any evidence to suggest that any of these interventions improve clinical outcome. But again, I think that's more of the design of the patients that were in the trial and the trials themselves, because I'm quite sure that if we select cohort, what we call cohort enrichment, and we select high-risk patients and we use these interventions, then it makes a difference. And I, I think it's the inability to select cohorts has led to the current uncertainty regarding, for example, aproponin. I think that aproponin in high-risk patients probably save lives, and in low-risk patients it probably doesn't save lives. It's probably no better than other drugs. And hence, when you mix these patients together, you get this very uncertain result from the clinical trials. Uh, and I think cohort enrichment by having risk scores, ways of identifying patients preoperatively who should be in these trials, uh, is very important. And we have a new risk score that was developed with 30 UK units that we'll be, again, we'll be presenting tomorrow. Factor seven, it was the great, it was the great lifesaver uh, after a protein was withdrawn, but then they did a, a systematic review of all the trials and they found out that it's a 60, 70% risk of, increased risk of major thromboembolic complications. So it has tended to drift out of use. There are new uh, therapeutic adjuncts like uh, PCCs and fibrinogen concentrate, and these have the advantage over uh, existing things like FFP and platelet, uh, FFP and cryo, and that you know what you're getting. You can buy it in a vial. It's safe. Uh, you can give it to Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, it's probably effective. PCCs, in my opinion, they may be the new factor seven. They may actually increase your risk of, of thromboembolic complications. That's my fear. They haven't been properly evaluated yet. The trials evaluating uh, intravenous fibrinogen have been very small and been very limited. And very limited. They limited in scope. Uh, but what I would say is that fibrinogen concentrate is actually the first line treatment uh, in, if you were in Germany or you were in somewhere else in, in Northern Europe and you were bleeding, they wouldn't give you platelets and FFP. The first thing they give you is fibrinogen. And that's because it's licensed in those countries. And, and actually, there are algorithms, which I don't have time to talk about now, but they show that giving fibrinogen first reduces your use of platelets and increases uh, uh, reduces mortality rates, and I, I don't have time to talk about that right now. So to summarize then, transfusion bleeding and adverse outcomes. Uh, I think that transfusion may or may not harm people, depending on the patient, uh, the person is given to, and depending on how much you give. I think that we need more research to define what is coagulopathy. We need to be able to diagnose it and define it, and I think only then we'll be able to really treat it effectively. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, we will take questions at the end. We'll have all the speakers up on the podium, so you'll have a chance to ask all the speakers questions at the end. So if you can save those for them. Thank you.